obviously we know the main stuff that you massively achieve your goals you know 10 times world sidecar champion but you know as a youngster before it all started you know uh, I read obviously your father was a was a great uh, champion grass track sidecar racer is that what kind of got you into the obviously to the, the, the racing mind as a youngster being dragged off every weekend yeah I think when you you know when you when you are a you, young lad and you bundled into a, a sidecar paddock, a grass track paddock for, that's what I can remember growing up in really, you know, so I had our own little bike uh, when I was I think about eight, nine years old we had a little sidecar that my dad had built us and yeah, it was inevitable that sooner or later you were, you know, I was, was going to have a go on one and it was just what type really, yeah. So you went, you went off obviously uh, as a youngster and uh, your first, your first sort of club race and, and uh, Obviously, uh, talk to it straight away and flip it. You know, I love what you're doing. Was it always the intention to go to, to GPs? Was that just a passion, or did it kind of fall on you and fall into your lap? Should we say? I think I look back and, and, and at, that, at those times when we when when we got to the stage where we could maybe I'd get a start at a, a world championship or start at a Grand Prix. You had to have been. There was a grading list, and you had to be on grading list one, two, or three, and that was like oh, right. you either you either been doing world championships the year before, or you were a British championship, or you'd done the European championship. Yeah. So for us as young young a young team, let's say, to try and get a start at a Grand Prix, uh, we did a deal with the ACU that if uh, if we did the Isle of Man TT, we got a start at Silverstone. And that was why that's that's why I went to the TT, and I loved the TT. I really? I really enjoyed it, and I, I, but I didn't get very far because I crashed. So that was the thirteenth milestone, and I spent the night in hospital and, and rode the bike off. And I, I read you nineteen eighty three. You crashed on the first lap, uh, the thirteenth mile. Was that the first practice lap or race lap? No, I, I actually got round. It's in practice. I got round. <laughs> the beautiful thing, but. I, I look back and I, did, I basically I didn't know where I was going. I think because you don't, do you? Yeah. And, uh, let me, a while, let me tell you, I still hate the 13th milestone. Yeah, you know, I, I only raced there three years, but uh, it was. That makes me feel a lot better. It was one of those places. Yeah. Well, no, in all fairness, it was one of those places where you can only use the right hand side of the road. So if you go over the white line, it's a negative camber, but it's one of those places where you always think, do you know what? You can go loads faster through there, but as soon as you go two mile an hour quicker, you're in a whole world of hell. No, well, I should have maybe I should have spoke to a few more experts before I went. I think maybe that was that was, and plus we took a bike with us. It was the ex uh, Jock Taylor bike that uh, bless him, Jock got killed on, and that got repaired. I then joined the Fowler's racing team, and we were um, yeah, we were sort of like pushed a little bit to use that bike. And really, it wasn't the right bike for the for the Isle of Man anyway. And I remember uh, Mick Body saying to me on the boat on the way there, he said, "Went over, he said, the best thing you can do when you get the, to Douglas is drive your van off, turn it around, and f off all my guns." He says, "Because with that bike, he says around here, you're not going to do anything." And, and yeah, I should have listened to him, shouldn't I? Oh, mate. Yeah, I mean, even now the modern world, of course, the the chassis now are so different for the TT as uh, for the short circuits yeah, even with the same engines it's completely different you know I talked to the Birchills a lot about what they use of course for the TT and it's so so different to, to what they're using for, for any of the short circuits yeah I think that when when you look at maybe some of the lads in the uh, who were doing the Grand Prix in, in, in the 80s and they used to maybe go at Salzburg and they'd be doing the practice and everything, and then they used to jump on a uh, jump either on a plane or, in, and then the following week they'd be doing to the Isle of Man, do the qualifying, and then maybe nip back and do a, a Grand Prix race. And they were jumping off, you know, or one bike onto another. And I always used to think that's, you know, it, it, it's, it's amazing how they can just seem to be able to do both. And uh, yeah, but I, like I say, the Isle of Man, I loved it, and there's no ex, nothing in all the World Championship races I had as the same experience as going through Kirk Michael flat out or whatever, you know, as fast as I could go. Yeah. And I remember in the, the practice week, I just thought, it, it's great. And probably, if I hadn't have had that accident, and maybe taken another bike, who knows, I might have gone on to, to do maybe more TT racing. So, we, we we decided that we would either concentrate on the World Championship or, or, or the, and it was just, we just went for that direction in the World Championship and just pushed all our efforts into making sure we could uh, get there and, and do that, really. Yeah. So the, that was going to be my next question. So there's no intention of when 
you know, when you finish at GPs, you wanted to go back, or it was just a, you know? Um, not really. I went back for the. I think we went back for the centenary meeting, like, and, and somebody had somebody had found one of Jock's old bikes, and it was a, a German guy called Rolf Bonner had it. And he said, "Will you will, will you ride the bike, Steve, at the at the TT?" Right. Uh, Paul in yeah, the parade, and, and, and Paul Phillips, the guy from the Alamand, had organised it all and everything. So, yeah, yeah, that'd be, that'd be good. So, I mean, I hadn't been round for well, I don't know how many years, but I'd never been round since we crashed. So it gets a, and it's a TZ 750 Yamaha outfit, so it's got quite a bit of power. And we set off. Uh, I think it was uh, Jeffrey's come flying past us on a solo. Yeah. Oh, I ain't gonna try and keep up with him. So. I remember slowing right down. At, I forget the place, but it's where the before the right hander is, where the uh, where the traffic lights are. And I, I, and I, I, I was turning off up a, a grass a grass lane and everything. I thought, oh, down a few more gears. <laughs> Got all the way to the waterworks and going up there. And then I felt this tapping on the on the bike. And I looked around and the passenger Paul Wooden. He's got his leg out and he's pointed at it like this. And we both had to stop and get off the bike because we both had cramp. And this marshal could run it up, he says, you all right? I said, yeah, yeah. We just, and we were that, because the slower you go, you hit every bump, don't you? But the faster you go, obviously, you're in maybe, I don't know, one in four bumps. But, so we were in every bump, and we were just, I was absolutely shattered, and we, we couldn't even do a lap. <laughs> so we thought, all right, no way we're going back there. Do you know, do you know what? Yeah, I, I went for a lap around a TT with Ben Virgil, and you can't, I couldn't say, you can't, I can't believe how many more bumps and jumps there are with a sidecar compared to a solo? Because you've got 35 minute travel, that's all they have on the, on the modern sidecars, you know. Um, and even coming out of case down to the Greg, you know, on a flipping solo, it's three wheelies, brake hard and turn right. Yeah, you know, on a sidecar, I was waving to the crowd and hanging out the back like a Superman <laughs> because there's just no travel. Yeah. Honestly, I'm not honestly. Yeah. I suppose you're going to be shocked me completely. You're going to hit a lot more bumps because yeah. you've got a lot more rubber on the road. Plus, yeah. you've got three wheels, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. And, and so little travel. Yeah, and we don't put any suspension on the sidecar for the passengers. We give out a rough time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, obviously, like... from passenger, and I know how easy it is for a driver. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> So, you know, going back to the, the, the GP job, you know, you quickly kind of went from club racing to, you know, national racing and then um, um, pretty quickly um, got through to the GP side. Yeah, going, going back to the, the deal for the Isle of Man, really, and then that, that was, we went then after the Isle of Man, we sort of like straightened ourselves up a little bit and got our old conventional bike back and then went to our first Grand Prix at Silverstone and luckily we finished fourth. Um, some of the other competitors broke down and we just we managed to get these how points. Long, how long after starting was this? Uh, how many years into your career? It was, was, it, was it a while ago, a one-off? Yeah, like yeah. a one-off to start with because you, we, we just couldn't get on any grading list or anything. So then we got a wild card uh, for the Silverstone Grand Prix and, and we finished fourth and we got some points. Yeah. And then the following week was the Swedish Grand Prix at uh, Anderstall. Yeah. So we jumped in our van, our old ambulance that we had at the time, and drove to, Swiss, uh, drove to Sweden and then camped outside the paddock and we broke in in the end to get in but once you're in the paddock and you had a few uh, world championship points we just then waited to get on the as a reserve and then to get on the grid and, and that's how you had to they had to do it because you didn't have any passage or anything to get in. So. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a great kind of uh, a lot of camaraderie with it with a sidecar guy, still is now, uh, and obviously there was back then. You know, um, did, did those guys help out to, to, to get you in? Yeah, I think when you used to, a lot of the lads, uh, they, they knew who, who were the good riders, let's say, or who'd had a good, good um, who was capable of doing well. And quite often you, you used to get. Your seeded riders would always get the starts at the Grand Prix, but then you'd, if you're in Sweden, say, somebody like Billy Galros would turn up, who was their local, uh, a, a, a good rider, who maybe didn't have at that time the point, uh, the points for qualifying and everything, but as long as you could do half decent lap time, they would give you a start as a reserve. So it was basically getting yourself there and just keep going and knocking on the door of the office and saying, you know, anybody, uh, anybody broke down yet or anybody, you know, just waiting, waiting the wings sort of thing. 